It's official now. According to the Oricon rankings, Blue Lock was Japan's best-selling manga of 2023. Now, you could cite a myriad of reasons for Blue Lock's success. Its adrenaline-fueled narrative, its stellar artwork, its impressive character writing. But what really strikes me about Blue Lock discourse is how often I hear from fans that they just resonate with Blue Lock's central message. Many readers find it genuinely inspiring that Blue Lock encourages them to channel their inner egoist. But while you could certainly extract universal life lessons from Blue Lock, there's also another dimension to its overarching message. From its very inception, Blue Lock explicitly positions itself as a commentary on Japanese society. And that's an aspect of the manga that, in my view, has not been taken as seriously as it should in the Western fanbase. So that's what this video is all about. I will try to situate Blue Lock in its cultural and political context, explore what it says about modern Japan that a story about unfettered egoism became its best-selling manga, and deconstruct some of Blue Lock's core assumptions in the process. Hello, my name is Sean, and I guarantee that you will look at Blue Lock differently after watching this video. Now, I do have to start with a bit of a disclaimer. I'm absolutely not the person to tackle this topic. For one, I have no connection to Japan. I don't speak the language, and I've never even set foot in Asia. I'm just some guy who talks about Japanese comic books on the internet. And secondly, while this video makes heavy use of research from the social sciences, I have no formal training in any of these disciplines. I have tried to read up on current research to the best of my abilities, but I have nothing close to a comprehensive understanding of the topics at hand. In all honesty, I'm not the person who should be making this video. But the longer I've been creating Blue Lock content, the more I have felt that this is a really important topic that needs to be discussed in the fandom. And since no one else seems to be tackling it, I felt that I should at least try to get the ball rolling. But all that being said, if you know more about this than I do, I would love to hear from you in the comments. This is definitely not meant to be the last word on Blue Lock and its place in Japanese society, but I really hope that it will at least spark some conversations. Now, I get the sense that many Western fans don't really acknowledge or discuss one of the most important aspects of Blue Lock. Namely, that it's by far the most overtly political title among best-selling shonen manga series in recent memory. And just to make sure that we're on the same page here, when I talk about a work of art being political, I mean that in a relatively broad sense. A political manga is a story that reflects on how human societies function by exploring topics such as human nature, social norms, ideologies, and power dynamics. In that light, Blue Lock's premise is incredibly political. According to Blue Lock, the middling state of Japanese football is reflective of a failure in Japanese society more broadly. Namely, that the Japanese lack the ego to reach the top. Jinpachi Ego makes this point most explicitly in Chapter 8. In his view, it's a distinct feature of the Japanese to devote themselves to their societal roles and to put the needs of the collective above their own. And for Ego, these traits are exactly what is holding Japan back from any lasting success on the global stage. With all this, Blue Lock is obviously tapping into long-standing cultural stereotypes about the Japanese and about East Asian peoples more broadly. Namely, that Japan can be characterized as a collectivist society, in marked contrast to Western individualism. 
I want to briefly clarify my terms here, since I will be talking about collectivism and individualism a lot in this video. The dichotomy between collectivism and individualism became prominent in the social sciences through a landmark 1984 study by Professor Geert Hofstede, who tried to trace the influence of a society's culture on the values and beliefs of its individual citizens. For Hofstede, a collectivist society is understood as one that prioritizes the common good and social harmony over individual interests. Collectivist societies are said to place high value in collective identity, in-group solidarity, duties and obligations, and group decision-making. On the other hand, an individualistic society is said to emphasize values such as autonomy, individual initiative, financial security, and universalism. And in their legal frameworks, they think in terms of rights rather than duties. Now you might say that Egel's diatribes are just about how to improve at football, and that I shouldn't read too much into a simple sports manga. But the thing is, there are many scenes suggesting that the lessons Blue Lock teaches about football carry over to life in general. Let me give you just one example. Chikiri's backstory revolves around a power struggle between himself and the Vanima twins. The Vanimas try to impose a hierarchy on their team with themselves at the top on the basis of seniority. Chikiri, on the other hand, espouses the view that players should earn their place on the team through merit alone. With this interaction, Blue Lock pits two distinct organizational philosophies against each other. And significantly, these are organizational philosophies with direct societal relevance beyond the world of high school football. Perhaps the most obvious point of reference for the Vanima Twins approach in a Japanese context is Japan's infamously hierarchical corporate landscape. At least in the cultural imagination, Japanese employees climb up the corporate ladder through loyalty and dedication to their superiors. So when Chigiri's rejection of the Vanima Twins the embodiment of the grim reality of the adult world that awaits many Japanese teenagers eventually backfires on him, Blue Lock also implicitly says something about what might happen to an individual who tries to resist the status quo in modern Japan. So long story short, Blue Lock's philosophy of egoism offers a direct challenge to Japan's allegedly collectivist mindset. And if you're still not convinced, I can also point to the word of God. In an interview with German magazine Animania, Blue Lock's writer Muneyuki Kaneshiro flat out states that it's a characteristic of Japanese people to value teamwork over their pursuit of their own interests. He describes himself as relatively assertive for a Japanese person and suggests that Blue Lock's premise might also be informed by his personal frustrations with life in Japan. And here's another bit from an interview with Kaneshiro and Yusuke Nomura, Blue Lock's artist, which was published for the Blue Lock exhibition, with many thanks to Mizuki on Twitter for their translation. Nomura here describes Jinpachi Ego as someone who says things that are outrageous, and yet somehow convincing. And Kaneshiro confirms that everything that comes out of Ego's mouth is meant to be correct. So all this then made me wonder what the research actually says about Japanese collectivism. And now I hate how clickbaity this is going to sound. But what I found genuinely blew my mind. You know what I learned about the cornerstone behind Blue Lock's entire narrative? That Japanese value the common goods over the needs of the individual? It's a complete lie. In 2018, 
Professors Yotaro Takano and Eiko Osaka published a review of 35 empirical studies from the past four decades that compared the attitudes and behaviors towards individualism and collectivism of Americans and Japanese people. Now, I know all the cultural stereotypes that are floating through your mind right now. The flag-waving American rifling down entire classes of school children in the name of freedom. As the ultimate representative, the pinnacle of individualism. In contrast to the Japanese salaryman dying from overwork as he prostrates himself to his superiors, who is the archetype of collectivism. But as it turns out, this is not at all what Takano and Osaka found in the data. Only 14% of the studies confirmed the stereotypical view, whereas 54% showed no significant difference between Japanese and American participants, and 32% even concluded that Japanese people are more individualistic than Americans. For instance, Japanese broadcaster NHK ran a survey including the following question. If you don't agree to your superior's direction, you don't have to follow it. And as it turns out, the Japanese emerged as the true egoists. 44% of the Japanese cohort agreed with the statement, in contrast to only 20% of the apparently subservient American respondents. I'll just fill your screen for a moment with all the studies that Takano and Osaka analyzed. And realize that this isn't even considering publication bias. In the sciences, it's generally harder to get research published that goes against commonly held assumptions. So if anything, it's more likely that studies which never saw the light of day would throw a further wrench into our cultural stereotypes. While reading the Takano and Osaka study, I also noticed an anecdote that is rather relevant for our understanding of Blue Lock's cultural context. When British coach Stuart Baxter arrived in Japan to coach Sanfrecce Hiroshima in the early 90s, he was expecting his Japanese players to sacrifice themselves for the sake of their team. The exact quality of Japanese football that Jinpachi Ego disparages so harshly in Chapter 1. But to his surprise, his players actually acted as egotistically as any other professional footballers. To put it in blue lock terms, Baxter expected to coach the U20 team, but ended up among the blue lock 11. So, okay. The research says unambiguously that the entire premise of Blue Lock is a lie. The reason that Japan isn't winning the World Cup has nothing to do with Japanese people being too group-centered to score goals. But upon reading all of this, I was filled with even more questions. It'd be one thing if this idea had been perpetuated by Europeans and North Americans. Then I could just chalk it up to the old racism and call it a day. But here we've got a Japanese author espousing a stereotype about a collectivist Japan that has no basis in reality. And apparently, there are enough Japanese readers out there who don't find this idea too offensive or ludicrous to buy his comics. Now, while I was leafing through the interviews with Kaneshiro, I came across some claims he made at two occasions that really jumped out to me. When interviewed by Natalie and Gendai, the Blue Lock writer tells a similar story about researching for Blue Lock. According to Kaneshiro, he showed drafts of Blue Lock to people involved in the actual Japanese football scene. Kaneshiro claims that he was quite nervous about doing this, and understandably so. Blue Lock shits all over Japanese football from its very first pages, after all. But when his readers were presented with the idea that Japan really needs more egotistical strikers, they all went, that's exactly right, to Kaneshiro's utter shock. 
Here's the paradox that really struck me about this. Kaneshiro genuinely seemed to think that his manga is an edgy, counter-cultural attack on the status quo, only to find that the status quo completely bought into his narrative. So either Kaneshiro is totally out of touch with popular sentiment in Japan, and his manga is a mere paper tiger, or there's something more to it. The pieces finally clicked together for me when I discovered an absolutely fascinating 2015 paper by Dr. Hirofumi Hashimoto and Professor Toshio Yamagishi about Japanese preference expectations, which I want to discuss in detail in this video. In their article, Hashimoto and Yamagishi explain aspects of Japanese cultural beliefs through what they call a social niche construction approach. In their words, the basic assumption of this approach is that the culture-specific behaviors are not simple reflections of personal values and preferences, but are rather reflections of the strategies that are useful for acquiring valuable resources from other people in a specific social niche. To put it in another way, differences in the behavior between people from distinct cultures don't always come about from an individual's personal beliefs, but may also have emerged because they offer advantages to people within a certain social group. Hashimoto and Yamagishi define a social niche as a stable pattern of responses from individuals to other individuals' behaviors, which, by the way, themselves are, of course, responses to other individuals, that make anticipation of other people's responses possible for individual actors. As they argue, it's simply very useful if there's a basic script for social interactions. But more than that, these social niches aren't arbitrary. They are reflections of underlying beliefs about human nature and the workings of human societies. And at least to a certain extent, social niches emerge because they help ensure our survival and prosperity. As Hashimoto and Yamagishi show, social niches that encourage collectivistic and individualistic behaviors can prefer significant advantages within specific historical contexts. As an example, they discuss why collectivistic strategies are useful to relatively secluded communities. Let's say you've got a village where everyone is strongly dependent on each other. There are only one or two blacksmiths, shoemakers, etc. Now imagine that one of the shoemakers starts overcharging and getting into fights with other villagers. Enough so that this absolute dingbat gets ostracized from the village. Well, then he's completely screwed, isn't he? As Hashimoto and Yamagishi write, in this type of social niche, the cost of being excluded from one's group and relationships is extremely high because excluded individuals have nowhere else to turn for their necessary resources. Thus, to minimize the risk of being rejected and excluded, individuals must be sensitive to other group members' attitudes towards them and must not offend those people. Furthermore, individuals living in this type of social niche generally share the belief that people are sensitive to others' attitudes and are willing to accommodate their needs. Next, let's imagine people living in a more interconnected society with a greater amount of choices for work and trade. Now suddenly, someone who remains in a closed group might lose out on economic opportunities. In the words of Hashimoto and Yamagishi, this new social niche that promotes individuals' opportunity-seeking activities outside the security of the closed group may be called the individualistic niche because this niche makes relative independence of individuals from the collective an adaptive strategy. Now apologies for going down a bit of a rabbit hole here, so let's get back to the point. 
the two scholars argue that social niches don't necessarily reflect the beliefs of individuals within a given society. But nevertheless, and this is the crucial point, people still adjust their behavior according to the script of their social niche. After all, one social niche offers a template for baseline interactions with other people, and failing to behave in predictable ways could get you in trouble or make you lose out on opportunities. In the aforementioned review study by Takedon Osaka, we learned that Japanese people are no less individualistic than Americans. But what Hashimoto and Yamagishi wanted to find out is what Japanese people believed about the assumptions of their fellow citizens. And so, they conducted a study where they handed a description of two people to a group of Americans and Japanese. One of them was characterized by typically individualistic traits, and the other by typically collectivist ones. The participants were then asked how much they themselves want to be like each of these two people, but also how they believe other people would evaluate them. First, both the Japanese and the American participants would themselves prefer to act like the person described through individualistic characteristics. However, they also discovered a discrepancy between what they think other people would say. While the Americans believed that others would also prefer the individualistic person, the Japanese participants thought that the majority would go for someone with collectivist traits. So here's what Hashimoto and Yamagishi make of their findings in light of social niche construction theory. Although the Japanese participants aspire to be independent, they believe that most people were interdependent and thus were required to adapt to the anticipated responses of the interdependent majority. Their default self-presentation reflected a compromise between their preference to be independent and the expected negative responses to independence from others. They also cite other studies which suggest that cultural beliefs can be maintained through the process of pluralistic ignorance, and conclude that certain beliefs thus constitute a self-sustaining system whereby individuals' incentive-driven behaviors further strengthen these common beliefs. In other words, Japanese people maintain that their compatriots are a collectivist bunch because Japanese society perpetuates this belief, and as a result, the individual will adjust their behavior accordingly even if it doesn't line up with their personal worldview. So with these results in mind, we can now make sense of Kaneshiro's surprise when everyone in the Japanese football scene agreed with Blue Lock's messages. Japan is filled with people like Kaneshiro, who believe themselves to be exceptions because they haven't swallowed the collectivism pill. And more than that, I would suggest that exactly this discrepancy between the cultural imagination and the actual situation on the ground can account for at least some of Blue Lock's success in its country of origin. This discrepancy is what allows Blue Lock to don a kind of countercultural aesthetic while espousing completely normative beliefs. Or to put it differently, it's even cooler to root for Blue Lock's egoist strikers when you're under the assumption that it would be provocative to do so, even though most everyone, including the folks running Japanese football, actually agree that unadulterated egoism trumps a blind belief in teamwork. So up to now, we've gotten a better understanding of how this idea of a collectivist Japan keeps lingering in the cultural imagination, even when it does not reflect the reality of modern Japanese society. 
But by now, you might be thinking that I've been dancing around the real question. How did this myth, which in this day and age it really is, of Japan as a prototypical collectivist nation arise in the first place? For that, I'll have to talk a bit about Japanese identity formation. And after that, I'll finally be in the position to make some more substantial claims about how Blue Lock fits into Japan's socio-political narratives. Now, before I discuss the Japanese situation, I want to address some preliminary principles about identity formation. Whenever you get any more or less clearly defined group, they will try to define themselves in terms of what sets them apart from other groups of people. That might include physical and geographic criteria, but groups also resort to cultural designators. Certain societies are, in part, distinct societies because they behave differently from those around them and partake in unique cultural practices. Or to put it differently, a group is only a group because of the existence of an other that is distinct from the in-group. And what that means is that the traits that a given society highlights as distinguishing features of their collective identity are not arbitrary. They're the ones that stand out most when comparing themselves to other societies. So now it's time for a bit of a history lesson. As is so often the case in Japan, the interest in collectivism harkens back to the Meiji Restoration of 1868, the moment when Japan was opened up to the world at large. In his monograph, Hegemony of Homogeneity, Professor Harumi Befu notes that the nature of Japanese identity has not been the same throughout the recent history of Japan. During the Edo period, China was the regional cultural and political powerhouse, and thereby a central reference point. And so, Japanese intellectuals constructed an identity for themselves by contrasting themselves with China. However, Professor Stephen Flastos has highlighted that Japan did not enter the modern era with a strong or unified sense of national identity. This is true for European and American states as well, by the way. The concept of a nation state with a national culture as we understand it today only emerged towards the end of the 19th century. Before that point, there wasn't really a strong sense that the inhabitants of the Japanese archipelago were somehow all Japanese. So basically, the emergence of a national consciousness in Japan coincided with a massive shift in Asian power structures. In the late 19th century, both China and Japan found themselves subjected to the whims of the European and American colonial powers. And therefore, Befu argues, China was no longer the most relevant point of reference. Japan found itself humiliated by the overwhelming military and technological superiority of quote-unquote Western nations. During this period, the Japanese also solicited the help of Western experts, who molded Japan's institutions according to European and American blueprints. And these experts very much regarded Japan as a backward country needing the enlightenment of the West. And this sentiment was very much adopted by many of Japan's leading intellectuals. It wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that the Meiji Revolution brought about a complex that persists to this very day. Ever since, the Japanese have made sense of their position in the world by comparing and contrasting themselves to the West. Now, just to briefly address this, using a term like the West suggests that Europe and North America are some kind of homogenous entity. 
The reason for this is not that I believe this to be the case, far from it, but because this imagined West is the other that Japan's most prominent identity discourse revolves around. Let's flash forward a few decades. As all of you will know, Imperial Japan had adopted an ideology of militaristic nationalism during the Second World War period, and this regime was responsible for the loss of countless lives, as well as for horrific crimes against humanity. But in the end, all of this came to nothing. For the second time, Japan was defeated, humiliated by the American army. And in the aftermath, Japan's political institutions were replaced by a democratic system based on that of the United States. Yet, the outcome of the Pacific War was perceived as not just a military, but also very much as a cultural defeat. Befu traces the sentiment of a disenchanted nation after its unconditional surrender left with unavoidable questions. If traditional Japanese values were worth anything, why did Japan lose the war? But more than that, Befu writes, before and during the war, wartime propagandists contrasted the democracy and individualism of the West with Japanese values and denigrated the former as worthless. Now, I've spent two months trying to pinpoint the exact moment in time when Japanese thinkers began contrasting their own culture to a perceived Western individualism, and I haven't been able to find a perfectly satisfactory answer. The earliest instance of this individualism-collectivism dichotomy I've been able to track down comes from wartime propaganda. But if you have any leads at all, please let me know. By now, I really need to get some closure on this. Either way, the stocks of Imperial Japanese values had fallen hard after the war. Blind obedience to authority and collectivism were associated with Japan and defeat, whereas Western democracy and individualism were all the rage. But as the 20th century progressed, the tides started shifting. Japan's post-war economic boom felt nothing short of a miracle. And with this prosperity came a newfound sense of confidence. From the late 60s, the Japanese realized they must be doing something right. And by the 70s, economists were speculating that Japan might be on track to become the wealthiest nation in the world. So now, the attention of Japanese thinkers shifted. The most pressing concern was no longer investigating the alleged cultural traits that resulted in the defeats in the Pacific War, but rather how these traits ushered in an era of unprecedented wealth and progress. And with that, the attitudes towards perceived Japanese characteristics did a complete 180. But what's interesting about this shift is that the discourse about Japanese identity still revolved around the same axes as during the post-war period. Japan's main point of reference and ultimate other was still the West, and this West was still characterized through the same monolithic, stereotypical traits and values that defined it since the Meiji period. But now, the very characteristics that set Japan apart from the West were being brought up to explain Japan's extraordinary success in the realm of global capitalism rather than its wartime failures. So let me introduce you to the world of Nihon Shinron, the study of Japanese-ness. Nihon Shinron is basically the catch-all term for Japan's mainstream identity discourse. At the core of Nihon Shinron stands the idea that the Japanese possess a number of essential characteristics, a Japanese heart or spirit, 
a kokoro for you, all you filthy weebs out there. Note, however, that Nihon Shinron doesn't have one authoritative source. Rather, it's a series of interconnected glo. Rather, it's a series of interconnected ideas floating in the ether that have become ubiquitous in Japanese thought. You can find them in the hundreds of books that are being published about Japaneseness, in talk shows, in everyday conversations. But more than that, Professors Rotem Koner and Harumi Befu have shown that Nihon Shinron is the hegemonic ideology in contemporary Japan. Not only are its tenets endorsed by the political establishment and the economic elite, but there is also virtually no other ideology that competes with it. Professor David Rear has written a brilliant analysis of Nihon Shinron thought in which he sets out the main tenets of how Nihon Jinron characterizes Japanese people and society. 1. Japan is unique. And while every nation is unique, Japan is more unique than others. 2. Japan has a distinctly homogenous population. 3. Japan's strong group consciousness stands in contrast to Western individualism. 4. In Japan, obligations, indebtedness, and shame take precedence over individual rights and duties, unlike in the West. And 5. Japanese people prefer harmony over conflict, but also emotions over rationality. There are a few things to note about this list. First, most of the overarching aspects of Japaneseness can be grouped under one umbrella term, namely, collectivism. Secondly, all these traits implicitly or explicitly serve to contrast these alleged Japanese characteristics with those of a nebulously defined West. Furthermore, it's important to understand that these beliefs have an ideological rather than a scientific, a verifiable basis. After all, we've seen that according to the research, Japanese people are no more collectivistic than Americans. Now, what I need to make clear here is that all of this stuff is not neutral. Konra and Befu demonstrate that Nihon Shinron ideology is inseparably connected to Japanese nationalism. Some have even called it the core ideology of Japanese nationalism. Nihon Shinron is an ideology that celebrates and privileges the ethnic Japanese and offers pseudo-scientific justifications for their wealth and power. And therefore, the scholars argue that there is also an unmistakable racial and at times even racist, common denominator that pervades its premises. We already saw that the basic terms of the juxtaposition between Japan and the West harken back to warp time propaganda. And well, let's just say that the conduct of the Japanese Empire was in part motivated and justified through racial ideology. I also briefly want to mention the observation by Dr. Toshiko Tsukaguchi Legrand that the discourse of Japanese collectivism has been happily co-opted and promoted by employers in the post-war period. And it's easy to see why. After all, it's quite handy if your workers believe that they are suffering through grueling hours of overtime because of their unique national character rather than because of unreasonable labor practices. Okay, history lesson over. Although by now, I've probably lost the vast majority of viewers. So let's see, with whoever is left over, if we can reach some final conclusions about the significance of Blue Lock and its commercial success within its cultural context. As our starting point, Blue Lock's central thesis is a direct challenge to an alleged Japanese national ethos, one that elects harmony over conflict, collective over individual. 
And what I think has emerged time and again in this video is just how widespread the myth of a collectivist Japan has been within Japanese society. This myth, moreover, serves to carve out a unique identity for Japan vis-a-vis -vis the world's other wealthy democratic nations. What's interesting, however, is that Blue Lock seems to reject the essentialist aspects of Nihonjiron ideology. Much of Nihonjiron thought is predicated on the idea that there are fundamental and immutable characteristics of Japanese people and culture. That you can uncover the same quintessentially Japanese ethos among, for instance, Edo period samurai and modern corporate employees. And that these traits account for Japan's power, success and prestige throughout history. Blue Lock, however, fundamentally rejects this idea. In the world of Blue Lock, Japanese collectivism is the result of ideology and power structures that have been almost imposed upon the Japanese people. Time and again, Blue Lock highlights how natural egoists emerge even in an environment where the entire system serves to snuff out individualistic tendencies. Japanese people do not fundamentally differ from the inhabitants of other nations. Ambitious football players arise all over the world, but their success does depend on whether their talents are nurtured or squashed in the bud. I highly recommend checking out my video about Blue Lock's backstories, where I discuss this in greater detail. But basically, the point that Blue Lock repeats over and over again is that Japan's approach to sports systematically fails some of its most talented athletes. Now I will have to admit that Ego perpetuates the collectivist stereotype himself in Chapter 8, where he states that certain sports are a more natural fit to Japanese people than others. But if we look at what the manga is actually showing us, it's interesting to note the contrast between how its cast responds to environments of enforced individualism versus ones of enforced collectivism. Egoists that are subjected to Japan's dominant football culture constantly struggle and suffer as they are forced into a mold that doesn't quite fit. But on the flip side, those who have taken the plunge into the pool of undiluted egoism find themselves liberated, freed from restrictions and dissonance. Now I could conclude that Blue Lock presents a worldview that rejects the intellectual foundation of contemporary Japanese nationalism, which I very much believe is the case. And yet, it is hard to deny that Blue Lock promotes a nationalistic project of its own. From the very first pages, it's clear that the ultimate purpose, the telos of Blue Lock, is winning the World Cup. Yes, Egel will also have created the world's greatest striker, but even that is presented as just a means to an end. It's especially noteworthy how Egel views it as self-evident that this achievement is worth pouring extravagant sums of money into. In fact, this is the exact point of contention between Anri and the bigwigs of the Japanese Football Federation in the manga's first pages. The latter see football as business, whereas Anri has set her sights on loftier goals. And what's significant here is that Blue Lock constantly frames the football as business figures as the enemy. They represent a defeatist mentality, with a grotesque rodent of a man as their figurehead. All this is underpinned by a certain unspoken assumption, that no expenses should be spared to secure glory for the motherland. And when looking at Blue Lock's brand of nationalism, it's also hard to avoid the militaristic language that pervades the manga. Since chapter 8, 
Lulak conceptualizes a footballer's abilities as a weapon. In one of his most important speeches, Egel proclaims that strikers are destroyers, and therefore they must take up arms to bring down their enemies. Note as well how Egel stands before a Japanese flag as he lists different weapons. The message is clear in my view. International football competitions are a modern day proxy for warfare, and that is why Japan needs to bring home a World Cup victory at any cost. The militaristic undertones of Blue Lock's football become even more explicit in the second selection. When Rin makes Isagi suffer defeat for the first time, he proclaims that Isagi's team falls short because they don't understand what is truly at stake. They are treating football as a sport, whereas Rin sees it for what it is. Football is a battlefield, where victory and defeat are to be equated to life and death. Now you might say that this is just Rin's misguided worldview, but that doesn't seem to be the case. During the rematch against Rin, there's a moment where Isagi starts parroting Rin's statement as he manipulates the playing field. For that, we have to dive into the Japanese for a moment. What Isagi says here is Senjo no Mirai Kakaero, rewrite the future of the battlefield. So for Isagi 2, football has become warfare. But more than that, the kanji for Senjo, battlefield, is glossed with katakana reading field. So basically, the implication is that in Isagi's mind, the football pitch is literally equated to a battlefield at this point. And that shift in mentality from teenage athlete to professional soldier is what allows him to catch up with Blue Lock's greatest player. Okay, I've got to stop myself from sinking away in another quagmire. Anyways, the myth of a collectivist Japan is inseparably connected to Japanese nationalism, which treats it as a cornerstone of Japanese identity. But at the same time, the reality is that modern Japanese people don't actually subscribe to collectivism themselves. And that makes sense within their contemporary socio-economic context. A shift to a more individualistic mindset can, at least in part, be explained through globalism and capitalism. After all, that's what Hashimoto and Yamagishi argued with their social niche construction framework. In a highly interconnected world, more individualistic behavioral patterns provide substantial competitive advantages. But at the same time, Blue Lock is also a manga with nationalistic tendencies. It's a manga that at times employs what is for me uncomfortably militaristic language to describe the workings of a competitive sport. And more than that, Blue Lock oftentimes blurs the line between the world of football and society at large. So here's my takeaway from all this. Blue Lock is an effort to promote nationalistic interests in a post-collectivist society. Within its ideological framework, Japanese success at football matters because it stands for more than just being good at a random sport. Japan's failure to win the World Cup also says something about the degree of power and influence Japan has on the global stage. And according to Blue Lock, this failure is the result of Japan's collectivist mentality, the national ethos that in mainstream Japanese identity discourse distinguishes Japan from Western nations. But the thing is, this myth of a collectivist Japan came about during the late 19th or early 20th century, during a time before Japan had adopted the economic and political systems of European and American nations. And now, in the 21st century, 
this juxtaposition between an individualistic West and a collectivist Japan has very little bearing on Japan's socio-political reality. So to me, part of Blue Lock's message is about how to promote and celebrate your country after rejecting the belief in something like a national ethos. After all, Blue Lock seems to suggest that humans around the world don't really differ on a fundamental level. And therefore, it approaches egoism as a facet of an underlying universal human nature. Deep down, every human being is a relentless egoist. And so, Blue Lock contests that Japan can achieve greatness on the international stage not by indulging in ideological myths, but rather by understanding and accommodating basic human psychology better than everyone else. Now I realize that some of you might feel a bit dissatisfied with my conclusions, that you might like me to say whether Blue Lock is good or bad. I figure that my discussion made it clear that Blue Lock's politics, at least how I've come to understand them, don't always align with my personal beliefs and values. At the same time, my purpose is not to cancel Blue Lock or to make you dislike something that you love. I myself am still a massive Blue Lock fan, and I will continue to cover the series for the foreseeable future. In my view, there's nothing inherently wrong with enjoying media when you don't completely agree with all of its messages. Also, it's not like it's an issue of all or nothing. There might be ideas in Blue Lock I don't agree with, but I've also found parts of the story genuinely moving and inspiring. That being said, I do think it's really important to try and understand what a story is communicating especially for a story as politically charged as Blue Lock. That's what inspired me to make this video in the first place, after all. And if I managed to have you look at Blue Lock with a fresh set of eyes, I think I've achieved my purpose. Anyways, before I let you go, I wanted to let you know that I'll be taking a bit of a break of Blue Lock content. Here's the reason. The third season of Sound Euphonium, which is my favorite anime of all time, will be coming out this April. Last year, I dropped an analysis of the first season, which, despite its lackluster performance, I still consider one of my best analyses ever. I've really wanted to continue covering the series ever since, and I figured that now is the perfect timing, right before the release of the final season. So that's what I'll be working on for the next few weeks. I will first shoot a remake of my Season 1 analysis, and then continue with two separate videos for Season 2, as well as the Sound Euphonium movie. If you're at all interested in this, make sure to subscribe to my second channel. My goal is to get all of this done in 6 weeks, but that might be a tad optimistic. Anyways, I'll keep you posted and I'm looking forward to seeing you again sometime soon.